So uh, once again, welcome to um, Women in Cognitive Science. It's a special series that we're doing uh, as part of Defining Cognitive Science, sponsored by the um, Cognitive Science Program here at SFU. So far, we've um, we've had uh, had three wonderful speakers already. We had Linda Castro on October fifth. We had Veronica Seminato on uh, October nineteenth, and then we had Kathleen Slaney on October 26th, and as you know, we're videotaping these presentations, so if you missed one, uh, check our website and you'll be able to uh, have a look at them again. Um, today, we're happy to introduce Leanne uh, Gabora in this series, um, and uh, Steve, our director, will, will do a proper introduction because you'll find that she, she's very well known in her field, and uh, Steve will do that justice. Thanks, Steve. And I'll also mention we have a talk next week. Uh, uh, Karen, I just forgot her last name, <laughs> from UBC, who's going to talk about haptex and, and robotics. Okay. Um, so it is a great honor to introduce Leanne um, uh, for her young age. She is incredibly published uh, and has a, a lot of uh, original uh, papers in quite complicated spaces around cognition, creativity, uh, cultural creativity. And she's, uh, as an intellectual researcher, she, she surely takes on some of the hard issues. So she, she looks at uh, mathematical theory and even quantum theory when she thinks about those areas. So much so, so that she was just honored this year with the prestigious uh, Berlin Award for Outstanding Researcher by the American uh, Psychological Association. Um, and she'll be talking today about her her work in um, in honing theory and creativity. So, Leanne Gabora. For that introduction, please. So, um, oh, oh, uh, this thing has a mind of its own. Okay, I don't know what's. There we go. All right. So uh, has anybody ever heard of the book, um, The Power of Now? I think Eckhart Tolle is actually based in this area. He's based in, in the Vancouver area. Well, what I work on is the power of then. So the power of humans to, um, to reconstruct the past, to recreate for other people or for yourself things that occurred at some time previously, to fantasize about what's going to happen in the future, and to envision what could be possible and actually change the world with it. So this is actually so commonplace right now that we forget how am amazing it really is. But you know, thousands of years ago, when the first people started to be able to take something that began as just a spark of insight in something in someone's mind and actually implement that idea and change the world with it, this would have seemed like an almost magical thing. And so we can ask the question, how is it that we're able to act creatively? Why is it, for example, that our brains are anatomically not all that different from the brains of other species, but we're the only species that is compelled to take other people's ideas and put our own spins on them, constantly adapt them to our own needs, to our own constraints, to our own tastes. And in so doing, creativity actually becomes an evolutionary process. We're constantly building on the creative ideas of other people, and the space of possible ideas keeps on growing and becoming more complex, and exhibiting some phenomena biological um, that, that appear in biological evolution, such as niches and uh, epistasis and stuff like that. So one of the things I study is, is uh, the evolution of culture and in what sense culture is, a is, a, is, a, um, is an evolutionary process. But I realized that in order to really understand how culture evolves, you really have to understand something about creativity. So that's actually the direction that I came at to start studying creativity which is a very different direction, much more theoretically inspired than the direction of a lot of other creativity researchers. So how does the creative process work? Well, I'll start off by talking about some state-of-the-art thoughts about creativity. Uh, it's well 
known that creativity begins with some kind of gap or lack of resolution in your mind, some kind of dissonance, some kind of problem that you might face. Uh, recently, the term problem finding has come about. And so problem finding refers to actually getting out there and looking for situations that don't quite make sense. And not trying to slide them under the rug, but trying to really come to terms with them. And instead of changing the world so that gap doesn't exist or that problem doesn't exist, change your understanding of the world so that it can accommodate that problem. And creative processes are often construed as beginning with Simon and Newell back in the 50s as search through some kind of search space, some kind of fitness landscape or adaptive landscape. You often hear the terms generate and explore. So generating new ideas and then exploring what possibilities are suggested by those new ideas. Uh, another way that creativity is thought about is as a proce process of combining or mutating pre-existing well-defined possibilities. And this is especially reflected in the Darwinian theory of creativity that uh, began with Donald Campbell in the 60s and that has become much more popularized by Dean Key Simonton lately. Uh, you also hear of the notion of restructuring the space. So the idea that in order for something to be genuinely creative, you actually have to not only search the space of possibilities that you started with, but you actually have to restructure, transform, or change this space in some way. And only then is it going to be what people like Margaret Bowden refer to as transformational creative. And it's often said that creative output is, <coughs> excuse me, genuinely creative if it meets two criteria. So the first one is it has to be new, right? It has to be original. And the second is that it has to be useful or task relevant or aesthetically pleasing, so useful and trust relevant, broadly construed. Some people also claim that it has to have quality. Other people incorporate the notion of quality into the notion of being useful and task relevant. But basically, we don't stray too far from two these two criteria that actually Guilford put forward in his 1950 APA address. Okay, so these are basic state-of-the-art ideas about how creativity is thought about. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present my own work on creativity, and I refer to it as the honing view of creativity. And just to get us in the, in the idea of uh, what is creative, I've put forward some examples of creativity that I find kind of striking. Some of them are actually, um, on the bottom left is uh, an artwork that was done by Ben Bogart. And after I gave a talk at the other SFU campus a few years ago, he came up to me very excited about an idea he had for an art project that was based, that was inspired by how it, the nature of associative memory makes possible the kind of creative insights that occur in, um, that he wanted to apply to an art making project. And on the bottom, it was just people's hands that are painted to look like animals. And all three of these just exemplify what I think of as something that really is, to use a way overused phrase, breaking out of the box and doing something very new. OK, so the first key feature of this honing theory of creativity that I want to talk about is what I call the actualization of potential. So what do I mean by that? Well, I told you that many people can construe creativity as a matter of searching through a space and just finding the really unusual possibilities. But the idea of searching through space implies that these ideas already exist in some kind of well-defined state prior to finding and selecting them. And the notion of potentiality implies that this isn't necessarily the case. So according to honing theory, creative ideas actually come into existence. They actualize through interaction with a context. And the context may be internally generated, so you think it through. Think, how could it work? How could I make this work? Or it could be externally generated. So for example, you might build a prototype of an idea, try it out, see if it really works, that kind of thing. Um, and so the idea is that prior to reaching its final complete state, an idea exists in what we're calling a state of potentiality. We call it potentiality because it could actualize different ways depending on the different contexts that it interacts with. Okay? And that it, the state that it's finally going to exist in did not exist, not even in any sense, until it actually went through the process of interacting with those contexts. And every interaction with a context changes the state of the idea. 
And it also changes the state of your mind and how you're conceiving of the idea. So it's through this repeated process of generating a new context, interacting that with the idea, generating a new context, interacting with the, the idea, that gives rise to the creative outcome. And you could say that prior to this interaction with the context, there are different possible outcomes, but these outcomes may not be separable. So for example, if you're talking to somebody and they have what an idea that they say is a half-baked idea, it may be that this half-baked idea is composed of many different things that they've encountered in their life that are somewhat related to the idea that they're eventually going to have, but they haven't yet been able to separate which parts are relevant, which parts are irrelevant, how are they going to come together. So to make this a little bit more concrete, I like to use the example of the invention of a beanbag chair. So say somebody was given the, um, the job of coming up with a really cozy, comfortable chair that you just want to flop into after a hard day at work. Well, say they um, went home and threw, to, threw a, a beanbag to a baby, and then the next day they came back, and they, they suddenly had the idea that, OK, if a little beanbag squishes to conform to the shape of your hand, then maybe a big beanbag could just, you know, squish to conform to the shape of your body, and it would make a really, really comfortable chair. Okay, so that, that instant that somebody first has, that first idea of a beanbag chair, they don't know all the details of the final implementation of that chair. For example, they don't know if it's going to have a flat back, they don't know if it's going to have four legs, they may have all these ideas about how it, what form it could take, but they haven't figured it out yet. And so that's what I mean by the different possible states are non-separable. They're all mixed up in this vague state. And we've actually uh, applied a, a, a form of mathematics that was first used to um, be applied to describing um, superposition states in quantum mechanics, we're using that to apply to the state of half-baked ideas. And this is just very tentative work, but uh, the rationale for it is the following. So um, the first use of this kind of mathematics was to account for two phenomena. One of them is the observer effect. So that's a situation where you have something, you want to know about the state of that, but any measurement that you could make of the state of that entity actually changes the state of the entity. And in a certain way, concepts are like that. So the concepts which we use and we combine in different ways to come up with creative ideas. So any time that you, uh, so, so say you want to know something about a concept, but any time you bring that concept to mind, you bring it to mind in a certain context. And that context unavoidably colors the state of the concept, right? So that was the first parallel that we had between the two situations that suggested, oh, well, there might be something about not the mathematics that was used for quantum mechanics, but a generalization of that mathematics that somebody I was working on was developing that might be applicable here. And the other situation had to do with entanglement. So in, entangled situ in a situation where two things are entangled, any manipulation you do to one part affects the other part simultaneously, even if they're actually at a distance. And there is something seems to be going on with concepts. So concepts can be so, come so combined together that they actually ha become the, the combined concept actually has characteristics that are not true of either of the two constituent concepts. Okay, so that was just the motivation for trying to use this, some of these ideas, bring them over from the first situation where science and encounter, where contextuality is very important, and import them to this other situation where contextuality is really important. That's a whole other talk that I just uh, gave this summer um, for the Society of Mathematical Psychology, uh, which uh, I won't go into that more here, but just to show you that that's sort of the motivation for for some of the ideas that I'm talking about here and some of the ideas about the approach. All right, so I said that I'm exploring this notion of uh, context-driven actualization of potential as a way of describing what happens in the creative process and a way of describing what is the state of an unfinished creative idea and comparing that against search and select type theories. And I want to just sort of make that more concrete with this little animation. So search and select site type theories focus on blindly generating separate well-formed solutions 
and you might take one and based on the characters of that, you might generate other ones that are similar to it, and then you choose the one that seems to be working the best, and then you generate a bunch of others that are similar to it, and then you choose the one that you like the best. And so that's a characteristic of how the creative process works in terms of a search and select type theory. And I want to contrast that with the theory that uh, we're talking about today, which is this actualization of potential theory. So the idea is that we hone potentiality using intuition and, and, uh, and intelligence, and we do that by causing the state of the idea to interact with, with certain contexts. As I said, they might be internally generated or externally generated. And Whereas, with respect to search and select theories, many are generated and the sparts is in selecting the right ones. Here, there's few that are generated. You don't generate a lot of ideas. You may even just generate one. But it becomes more and more well-defined over time. Okay, so the smarts is, not, is in the generating and in the honing, not in how you're selecting. I'm going to skip over that bit and just say something about how this interaction with a context causes the actualization of potentiality. Okay, so I said that creative potential actually originates in concepts and how they interact with one another. Because at the heart of every creative process, you're putting concepts in new contexts or combining them in new ways. So just to go back to this example that I used before, we've got the concept of beanbag. And beanbags have different properties. So one property is that you can throw a beanbag. Another property is that it's safe for babies. Another property is that it's soft. And another one is that it conforms to shape. And I put a line through the first two to show that they're both relevant to the context of throwing the beanbag to the baby. And I put a blue line through the second two to show that they're relevant to the context of inventing a comfortable chair. And what we say happens in the context of needing to invent the comfortable chair all this potentiality collapses so that only the ones that are relevant to that context become important, become relevant. And in this context, it's only the fact that it conforms to shape and that it's soft that is relevant and causes it you to actualize the idea of a beanbag chair. All right, so a second element of this honing theory of creativity that I've been talking about is the notion of self-organization. And uh, what I'm saying is that the creative process, we're, we're, we're compelled to resolve states of potentiality. And we do that very naturally because of the self-organizing, self-mending properties of a worldview. So I'll just explain a little bit what I mean by worldview. Just, uh, using that term to refer to someone's mental model of reality. So you could say it's a way of seeing the world. It's also a way of being in the world. And there's a lot of evidence that our worldviews are integrated. So the different parts are connected. They can speak to each other. And that's uh, shown by seven, several different properties of how we, how we interact in the world. So we can prioritize. We can say one thing's more important than another. We can adapt ideas to new situations. We can frame new experiences in terms of old ones. And we can combine information from different domains. So I said that a worldview is self-organizing. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that using a little animation. So say you were to spill a bunch of buttons on the floor and then randomly tie together two buttons with a thread and repeat this again and again and lift a button and see how many buttons are connected to it. And you'd, what you'd start to get is clusters of buttons would start to emerge. And if you kept on going, then you'd find that the, buster, the, the clusters would join to form one giant cluster. And so now if you say that the buttons are actually memories or ideas and the strings are actually associations, you can say that it's integrated when for any memory or thought there exists a potential path to any other memory. And these, these, the basic idea, this basic model comes from graph theory. And it was first used to um, apply it in, a, in, a, in the context of uh, living structures by Stuart Kaufman, who was interested in what kind of system could be at the heart of the very earliest metabolism, the very earliest thing that could be said to be alive. And so he was playing around with these um, 
these uh, systems where, in his case, the buttons were actually catalytic molecules and the strings were actually the reactions that occur between them. And he and other people have found that there's this interesting relationship between the ratio of edges to nodes or strings to buttons and the size of the largest cluster. So they found that as the ratio of edges to nodes, you reach a point where you get a sudden increase in the size of la lar the largest cluster. So it goes from being very disconnected to suddenly being very connected. And so I was thinking about uh, what process could have initiated not the origin of life, but the origin of culture, the origin of the ability for ideas to build on themselves. And it seemed to me that what you had to have was a mind that was not just capable of making the appropriate stim uh, actions in response to the appropriate stimuli, but the mind that was capable of taking any situation it would encounter and reframing it in its own terms, sculpting it in response to its own needs or concerns or desires or aesthetic tastes. And for that, you'd have to have a cognitive structure where the different parts could talk to one another, right? You'd have to have a cognitive structure that was integrated. And I started reading the developmental literature and finding that at around four or five years of age, children actually give evidence of having the kind of cognitive structure that is integrated, where they can reframe one piece of information in terms of other information. Also, at around this time of age, they start showing signs of being creative in a, in a way that isn't just random, but that actually takes some smarts. So it actually takes some... Uh, some noticing of deep similarities or deep structure before they combine ideas together. So I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. So it may be that the self-organization of a worldview is what allows an individual to be creative, and it what's, it's what allows them to become a participant, an active participant in the evolution of culture, because for ideas that come along, they can take these ideas and put their own spin on it, reframe it in their own terms. <laughs> So the, so the basic idea of this, Hone, and anything that I sort of skip over quickly, you're more than welcome to ask me about it at the end. I'll try to have time for questions. But the basic idea of honing theory, then, is that your creative outputs reflect the tendency of your worldview, your internal model of the world, to resolve states of potentiality through the self-organized transformation. And I wrote that it's not restricted to the problem domain, to... to um, to uh, contrast it with most theories of creativity, which say that when you're involved in a creative task, you have some kind of mental change going on, but that mental change is specific to the domain that you're working in. Okay, so the idea here is that anything in your mind that you've ever been exposed to is potentially food for your creative process. Okay? So it's not necessarily restricted to the problem domain. Uh, and the idea is that the external change, so the creative output that you're putting into the world, is mirrored by an internal change. So you could say it's a reintegration of some kind of fragmentation, some kind of gap in your worldview. There's a tendency to creatively adapt ideas to our own needs, tastes, perspectives, and that fuels cultural evolution. What ev evolves is not specific ideas themselves, but the worldview as a whole. So it's necessary that the worldview can only express things one at a time, but that it's actually the change in the worldview that's what's evolving over time. And I propose it evolves through a communal exchange process that, in fact, was inspired by uh, metabolism first theories of how the very earliest things evolved before there was DNA, before there was some kind of self-assembly code. So that's also not something I'm gonna go into in detail here. It's a non-Darwinian process, so it's not evolving through competitive exclusion and survival of just the fittest and death of all those that are not fit. It's a matter of everybody is transforming over time. So change isn't due to some of them living and some of them dying. Change is due to everybody is transforming over time. And the last thing I wanted to introduce about this notion of the um, worldview being self-organizing is the notion of a self-made worldview. So you could say the worldview is self-made to the extent that its structure is the product of your own thought processes. So there could be a spectrum from socially made to self-made. 
So the guy on the left is basically not too much more than a pretty face. He just takes everything that he's told, and his mind is a compendium of all these rules that he's been told. And he can get by pretty well like that. But as we go more and more to the right, we have individuals who are represented by the little dotted lines. They've actually sought something through for themselves. So they've gone beyond what they've been told and tried to make a cohesive mental structure out of it. And then once you get to the right, you've got somebody who actually most of the knowledge in her in her mind reflects things that she's thought through herself in her own way she's used the the rules of society as building blocks but she's gone very far beyond that and so that's what i mean by a self-made worldview all right now the last uh, thing i wanted to talk about is some um, the idea of contextual focus and i'm kind of going to run through that um, because I want there to be time for questions. I want to get through a bunch of other stuff. But the idea is that there's two different modes of thought, and there's also two sides to creativity. And I'll just read you this quote, because it is so brilliant. This is a quote by Frank Barron, who's a well-known creativity researcher. He was at uh, UC Santa Cruz. The creative genius may be at once naive and knowledgeable, being at home equally to primitive symbolism or rigorous logic. He's both more primitive and more cultured, more destructive and more constructive, Occasionally crazier, yet adamantly saner than the average person. So the last basic tenet of this honing theory of creativity that I've been talking about, so state of potentiality, self-organization, and then the last one is called contextual mo focus, so the ability to shift between two different modes of thought. So the idea is that if you have very f in a very focused state of attention, that's conducive to an analytic form of thought. You're zeroing in on the most important relevance. You're considering ideas just in their terms of their basic atomic structure. And you can shift between this focused sort of attention and a more defocused mode of attention. And that's conducive to a more associative form of thought, sometimes also referred to as divergent thought. But there's a difference between the two that I can talk about if you're interested. And in this state, more obscure but potentially relevant elements come to your mind. It involves a more diffuse activation, analogous to increasing the temperature in simulated annealing, in case anybody um, knows about that. And if, why do I think this is important is that if you are able to engage in these two forms of thought, then this big interconnected structure that I was talking about earlier, where the different parts can talk to each other, can almost talk in different languages or different levels of specificity. So the fruits of one mode of thought can actually become ingredients for the other mode of thought. And so what I propose is that, oh yeah, and so, so ind different individuals might have a mode of thought that they're most comfortable in, that they spend most of the time in. So maybe somebody who's, um, a, uh, a um, technician might work at the blue end. Somebody who's a poet might work at the other end. You might have some people, like Steve over here, who sort of span the gamut from one extreme to the other. And I propose that actually this ability, this onset of the ability to engage in contextual focus is actually the reason for the, what has been called the Big Bang of, of creativity, which happened 100,000 years ago. And um, Miriam Sabiri actually uh, worked on a computer model with me where we actually tested that hypothesis. And if you're interested in that, I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, now, I was going to move on to the second part of the, the talk. The first part of the talk was actually just presenting the idea, what is this honing theory of creativity and how does it work? And the second part of the talk is presenting evidence for it. So do, I'll, I'll maybe go through some of this evidence quickly and then, and then pause at that point. Does that sound good? Right. So the first source of evidence comes from some of the um, attributes of associative memory. And I'll run through this uh, quickly. So one is that memory is sparse, so the number of neurons is much smaller than the number of items that can be encoded in memory. So if you have some kind of schematic representation of a portion of memory, then you've got these um, black circles that represent neurons, and the orange bars represent actually some kind of microfeature, something that they respond to. So the neuron on the bottom, say, it would, it would get excited if there's any horizontal lines. The neuron on the top would get excited if there's any vertical lines. But 
there is no neuron that exactly corresponds to, neuro to lines of that particular orientation that it's encountering in the world. And yet, we can encode lines of that orientation nevertheless because of another characteristic of associative memory. And that's that items are distributed. They're spread out across cell assemblies, also sometimes called neural cliques, containing many different neurons. And likewise, each neuron participates in the encoding of many items. So here we've got a similar kind of representation. And this just shows that the line of this orientation, although there is no one neuron that is tuned to respond maximally to lines of that orientation, because the stimulation is distributed across those three neurons there. If all three of them fire, then your mind can extract the actual orientation of the line, and that's how it um, responds to, uh, to all stimuli. So it has, uses this distributed representation. And another characteristic of memory is that it's content addressable. And that means that there is a relationship between the content or the meaning of a stimulus and where in the memory it, uh, it activates, which particular neurons are activated. So for example, lines of the just off of horizontal activated the lower right hand quad left hand quadrant the flat line activated the middle of the of the memory the one that is the third line activated the upper right and then the fourth one because it has the same content as the first one activated the same region of memory okay so if you put these characteristics of associative memory, you actually come up with a kind of memory that would be conducive to um, actualizing states of potentiality through honing. So it's very consistent with what, what I've been proposing how is the method by which the honing theory would work. So to go back to this example of the beanbag chair again, so your goal is to invent a comfortable chair. So say chairs characteristics of chairs are encoded in certain region of memory, and I've sort of diagrammed that, simplified that by showing that they're encoded in A and B. And characteristics of bean bags would be encoded in other neurons, say, represented by C, D, and E. And let's say C is a neuron that responds to anything that has the characteristic of conforming to shape. Okay? So whenever you encounter something that conforms to shape, neuron C gets activated. And a beam, it, it would get activated by a beanbag, because beanbags correspond to uh, conform to shape. But let's say it was a little bit activated because you were just throwing a beanbag the other night. And then the next day, you have this task of inventing a comfortable chair. Well, because it's still a little bit be activated, then it's activated alongside the typical characteristics of chair. And that context of comfortable causes the concept of chair to include C, which activates beanbag, which leads to the invention of the beanbag chair. Okay. So this was in a state of potentiality beforehand because you never actually were told about a beanbag chair. So in a certain sense, what you're doing if you, if you invent the beanbag chair is you're pulling out of your memory something that was never explicitly stored in memory. But because of the brilliant, sparse, distributed, content addressable architecture of human memory, you were able to, given a certain context, put things together in a new way that was relevant and produce something creative. So it existed as a potentiality due to the sparse, distributed, content addressable nature of how items are encoded, and in the context of planning a comfy chair, it conforms to shape was activated alongside other features of chair, leading it to combine with beanbag. You could say the potential actualizes through honing. So an ill-defined elements of the half-baked idea become well-defined over time. So first of all, you're not, as I said, you're not sure whether it should have legs, whether it should have a flat back, and so forth. But as you think it through, as you apply particular context to it, thinking it through, or maybe making a prototype and trying it out, all of this becomes clearer and clearer over time. And that's what I'm referring to as the honing process. And I wanted to, um, actually, maybe that, so, so I'm going to just skip through some other things now, and maybe I'll talk about them later if we have time. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of context here. So, 
So I said that there were these two modes of thought, right? One is more analytic or convergent, and one is more divergent. And I wanted to show you a little bit about how the two modes of thought apply to this model. So say the gold ring represents all of the neurons that are activated in this more precise analytic mode of thought. And the green circles are neurons that are activated in either mode of thought. The red circles um, represent neurons that are activated in associative thought in a particular context. And the purple circles represent neurons that are activated in an associative mode of thought in another, mode, in another context. And so what I wanted to convey here is that, say, the purple ones are the ones that are activated in the context of wanting to make a really comfortable chair. So they respond to one of them might be that neuron that responded to anything that conforms to shape and so forth. But what I wanted to convey with this picture is that in a different context, say you had to invent an office chair, or say you had to invent a chair for a doll, it would be other neurons that would be activated. Okay, so which neurons are activated depends very highly on the context. And that's one way in which the honing theory differs from many other contemporary theories of creativity, which just say that when you're thinking creatively, you're thinking more divergently. So all of the other possibilities become available to you. Whereas according to honing theory, you're not thinking more divergently, your thinking is very constrained by context. So you're thinking of more possibilities, but in a very constrained way. And so just sort of recap how these attributes of associative memory support honing. So representations of concepts are distributed across multiple neurons, each of which contain, responds to a particular micro feature. Associative thought evokes overlapping distributions that are not usually evoked together, and that's the idea of a potentiality state. Honing involves determining which microfeatures of original concepts are relevant for the new idea. And I'm just going to like flick past the experimental evidence because I want to have some time for, for, for uh, questions, but if you're interested in any of these, we can go back to them later. So. Uh, Honing theory predicts that there'd be a correlation between creativity and developmental antecedents expected to stimulate how, stimulate how thinking through for oneself, so honing a self-made worldview, and that's actually the case. It's actually also associated, sadly enough, with lack of parental warmth and uh, with a high incidence of parental loss. So these are, again, situations that would stimulate you to think for yourself and to hone ideas. Um, the pr another prediction of honing theory is that once the self-made portion of the worldview is depleted, one is less able to generate unique creative output. And in fact, it is the case. There's been thousands of studies of this, actually, that have shown that after the, 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 there is a peak in people's creative lifespan. So, and the peak actually depends on what you do. So if you are a uh, mathematician and if you haven't made your big breakthrough by the time you're 30 years old, you're a goner. But if you're a philosopher or a, um, a fiction writer, then you're OK up until about 60. So there is a peak with respect to people's creative output, but that peak depends on where you are in your lifetime. And this, again, is consistent with the predictions of honing theory. Another prediction is, um, has to do with the recognizability of creative style within and across domains. So this is actually something I've talked with some people here about before. So the prediction is that since creative output reflects not just chance or expertise, expertise but the unique structure of a world view, honing theory predicts that an artist's style or voice is recognizable both within and between domains. And in fact, we've done many studies of this showing that that is, in fact, the case. So if you give creative writing students um, works of creative writing that uh, are made by other people in their class, well, they'll definitely, they will always recognize that creative writing. But in fact, if you give them works of art, they will also recognize the world works of art. And, uh, and, and the significance is not as high, but it's still um, definitely significant. And, 
Why I even thought of this doing, doing this kind of experiment of testing the recognizability of cross-domain creativity was because I was in a situation where I was dancing on a regular basis with a bunch of other people. And we actually didn't know each other verbally because we weren't allowed to talk in the dance space. But one time there was an art showing by people who participated in this dance group. And I found that I didn't even have to go up to the pieces of art to see who had done it. I actually could tell who had done it just because I knew these people's relationship to um, their body so well. I knew how they expressed themselves. I know what kind of lines they're attracted to by the way that they moved. And I was just getting them all right, having no idea who had done each one. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe there is something that is at the essence of each person, that when they're being creative, they're trying to express. And maybe that essence will come through in different domains. So this is, we're studying all kinds of different variants of this kind of, um, this kind of procedure. But it has been really fun to see that it worked, and we just got a paper accepted on that. Um, another prediction is that, uh, OK, uh, the creative process genuinely reflects the resolution of potentiality through self-organized transformation of a worldview. Creative outputs will feel authentic, and this authenticity will be recognizable. And we also studied this. So we had dancers and stand-up comedians. And we asked them to, um, we asked people in the audience to rate how authentic or how genuine their performances felt versus how fake or forced or imitated they seemed. And we found that there was indeed a huge, um, very high correspondence between how they were rated, not only between the members of the audience, but between the members of the audience and the performer themselves, which suggests that there is something real about this notion of authenticity and genuineness. We all talk about it all the time, right? We might say, well, that newscaster seems really fake, or that, that person seems very genuine. But do we all really see these things and feel them the same way? And it turned out that hadn't been analyzed before, and it was something that was predicted by this view of creativity. So there's a whole bunch of other experiments that I could talk about. Um, we studied states of, potenti of, of uh, potentiality and analogy making, and uh, uh, we studied self-organized criticality and insight and got some cool data there. Um, but I think what I'll just do, because we only have 10 minutes left, is just stop and, and ask if there's any questions. What does that What? What is that picture? Why don't you explain this one before, you, before we go to questions, since it's real, a lot of interest. To it. Oh, OK. Well, there's actually two slides before that that I'd kind of have to go through. So um, I said that uh, the honing theory of creativity is inspired by the view that the mind of this self-organizing, self-mending um, structure. And that this was inspired by the idea that, um, OK, what kind of structure could lie at the heart of the origin of cultural evolution? And, um, and it, it had previously been found that there was a lot of evidence that the earliest things that lie at the heart of biological evolution has this kind of self-organizing, self-mending structure. Okay? So things that um, exhibit self-organization uh, often ex have a phenomena that they exhibit called self-organized criticality. Okay, so the, the canonical example of self-organized criticality involves just taking um, Sand, so I'm just taking sand and I'm dropping it down one grain of sand at a time. And at a certain point, all of the sand is going to suddenly flatten, right? So there's going to be an avalanche. And so it turns out that um, systems that, dis that uh, display all these interesting phenomena that are complex systems that um, they, they exhibit this, this phenomenon of self-organized criticality. If you plot the, ratio, the, um, the size of the avalanches, so if you, if you kept on dropping the sand, some of the avalanches would just be little local avalanches, and some of them would completely flatten out the sand pile, and then there'd be a whole range in between that, right? And so if you plot the size of the avalanche versus the um, number of avalanches of that size on a log-log plot, then it, it exhibits a, a flat line. And that's a characteristic of comp complex systems, that they exhibit this kind of relationship. So the idea that I was thinking about here is, OK, so 
So if the mind is also a complex system that exhibits all these nice complex properties, then then, it, then you might expect it to exhibit self-organized criticality in the following sense. So most of your thoughts are kind of mundane. I have to walk the dog or whatever. But once in a while, you have a thought that changes how you think about something else, that changes how you think about something else, that completely reorganizes your internal model of the world, right? And so, and there's a distribution there. So most of them are really mundane. Some of them are really revolutionary. Most of them are somewhere in between. So I have the thought of trying to... Um, plot the magnitude of the, of, the, of the creative insight versus the frequency of insights of that magnitude. And so what I needed was a bunch of data on um, creative breakthroughs. And the closest thing that I could get at that point in time was data from the um, red RED catalog on the number of compositions uh, sorry, the number of recordings of compositions by a whole bunch of musical composers. And so, so for each composer, the graph is composed of points that give the log of the number of compositions versus the log of the number of recordings of that composition. And uh, that's basically what we have here. So if it exhibited, if it would exhibit sort of evidence of self-organized criticality, these would all be straight lines. They're not all straight lines, but they mostly fall off at the tail ends. And I think I can explain why that is. So because I wasn't looking at the magnitude of a creative insight, but the number of times these creative outputs were recorded, I think both of the tail ends are, supposed, are going to be exaggerated for different reasons. So if something does get recorded, if something is considered good, then it gets recorded a lot of times, and then it just spreads like wildfire through word of mouth and becomes viral, and then it gets way more recordings than it should, given the magnitude of that creative breakthrough. Right? And then on the other end of the scale, if a composer is embarrassed about a work, if they didn't like it very much, then they're not going to record it at all. Okay? So that's why I was thinking, OK, well, you do get the kind of pattern that you'd expect. You, the tail ends don't conform to that pattern, but there's a good reason why those tail ends might not conform to the pattern. So what I'm looking for is actually if anybody has data on the magnitude of creative breakthroughs that are a more direct um, measure of the creativity than just the number of recordings. So for example, expert ratings of creativity for many different creative artists in some domain. So that's what that is. And um, maybe I'll just ask if anybody has questions. Or... First, let's just thank you for the talk. Thanks very much. Should I put up my summary slide just to sure. summarize? Okay. So creative process arising due to the self organizing, self mending, autopoetic nature of a worldview. The self more weighed worldview is more creative. Unfinished creative ideas exist in a state of potentiality. They're ill-defined with respect to each other. Honing as the interaction between the conception of the task and internally or externally generated context until the creative idea is well-defined. Contextual focus says the ability to shift between different modes of thought, an associated mode of thought, and an analytic mode of thought. Equal emphasis on the external product and the internal restructuring of the creative task and the worldview. Creativity is also self-organizing at the level of a society. And then I had a bunch of predictions of the honing theory that are met with respect to various sorts of evidence that I didn't really get too much of a chance to talk to, but we can talk about them with you. So since we're uh, recording, we just need to use the mics. Does anyone have any questions for, for Leanne? I'll just pass the mic over. Hello, thanks for your uh, talk, that was really interesting. I have a, somehow a quite general question that may have to do with the definition of creativity, um, but I want to point at your particular theory here. I'm, I'm interested in my research myself in what we call computational creativity, uh, that um, looks at 
creativity as it could be, as opposed as creativity as, as it is, and you're more interested apparently in, in human creativity, which makes a lot of sense, obviously. Um, but we observe in nature, um, in general, and for animals in particular, or we, dev we are able to engineer a machine that apparently undo some sort of creative uh, behavior. So we can observe creativity that apparently has nothing to do with the presence of neurons in the first place. How, how, how would you um, um, talk about that and how does it relate or not to, to your approach uh, in that case? So are you saying does that still count as being creative? Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, oh I would say definitely. I would say even some of the forces of the universe that created, you know, the stars and stuff could be called creative, right? They're generating something that's new. Mm -hmm. um, and, and do you think that therefore the, the, the concept and the process, in a way, if we abstract from the neural uh, aspect of things that you put forward can still apply to these other types of creativity, like non-human creativity? Okay, well, what humans seem to do that is maybe special is that we take each other's creativity and we intentionally put our own spin on it. So we, like I was saying, adapt it to our own needs. And what's really new and exciting about that is then it's cumulative. And then you also see that one idea will open up niches for other ideas. So somebody invented the car and that created niches for things like seat belts and stoplights and so forth. And other species, other animals actually do things that could be called creative, but we seem to be unique in that respect, that we open up new niches for each other's creativity in this kind of um, intentional way. And, uh, and I think that you could capture that with a machine, actually, um, but I don't know of anybody who's, who's gotten very far with that. But yeah, I think it's possible. I would like to know more about what you're doing, actually. And, uh, I think we, we try to go for dinner later. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not a scholar, but I'm interested in perhaps the ways that this description that you have might become prescriptive in terms of social evolution. And I want to present the example of a friend of mine who is a doctor and who talks about the, uh, the process of diagnosis as being a very creative process. But because she's a doctor for the United States military, uh, she has this new type of computerized diagnostic tool in which she's supposed to choose the diagnosis first and put that down. And so it's making a lot of extra work for her because she has to go somewhere else and do all her regular work and then come back and put the diagnosis. But the diagnosis is very creative. So what I'm thinking is that uh, there are processes, social processes that are closing down a context for creativity and that we're starting to get a lot of them. And so I'm interested in what, in the possibility that a theory like yours might start to break that uh, trend. Oh, that's really interesting. I haven't actually thought about that, but I also have friends who work on um, on the kinds of programs that you, you said that your your friend is using. And I guess uh, I can see why you would make that comment because a theory of creativity that stresses placing something in a new context and seeing how it looks through interaction with that new context um, sort of flies in the face of a developing an approach that is good for every context and that sort of covers and, and that just sort of pro applies rules and goes through those rules. So, um, so I can see the potential for that, but I don't know of anybody who's thought about, about doing that. So maybe a, a context sensitive approach to diagnosis that allows for the incorporation of these subtle things that may affect the, the, the diagnostic outcome in ways that were that would not be captured by the kind of method that's being used now. So the computer programs might improve. <laughs> they might, or we may just go back to the old traditional forms. I mean, I guess one of the things about diagnosis is that uh, you are, when, it, when you're just doing it in a more intuitive way, you may be using all kinds of signals, just like the tone of the person's voice or like the, the color of their skin, things that you wouldn't so sort of be thinking about concretely enough to put in the computer program, but that nevertheless could have some effect on how you're thinking about the disease. So, 
So another instance of how, you know, the importance of context and all the sort of subtle ways that it maybe influences our outcomes that uh, can't be necessarily be captured very easily already by a computer. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, it might be a question. You're the one who gave the talk about the uh, computer generated in last year's uh, series. Was that you? Or? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, as part of the audience question and answer to that talk, <clears throat> the idea came out that um, there has to be an element of randomness and creativity. That, uh, say, you're designing a chair, there are a billion possibilities uh, based on the parameters and the constraints to form a chair. And, and you have two computer programs. One, um, maybe with a heuristic, uh, picks five at random, uh, evaluates them, chooses the best one. You can call that creative, but if you have a powerful computer that explores all billion possibilities, evaluates them all, chooses the very best one, that's not creativity, that's the opposite of creativity, that's brute force. And, uh, well, d deep thought, the chess program. Uh, if a human came up with those same moves, you would say, my God, that's the most creative chess player I've ever seen in my lifetime. A computer does it through brute, brute force, and that's absolutely not creativity. It's, it's the opposite. So is that how you see uh, creativity in the machine realm? That uh, it has to be, there has to be randomness at some level, otherwise you can't plug the name. No. Um, OK, but, I mean, I guess the theory that I, of creativity that I'm putting forward is that sort of creativity is the external output of some kind of internal self-organizing, self-mending process that's having a transformative effect on a cognitive structure, right? And if you're just sort of randomly generating brute force possibilities, it's not having, it's not sort of, I mean, the creative output, you could say, is almost the excrement of the, what really matters, which is this internal process, right? And, you know, this is not, this is not what's going on in, in, um, in one of these computer programs that, work, that works by, by randomness, right? Um, and that, I guess you don't, you don't actually even need the randomness if you've got a content addressable distributed memory. Because, the, I mean, the beauty of that is that because similar things are stored in, in overlapping distributions of memory locations, it automatically goes to the right one without having to search all the other ones because that right, that right one has something that was stored there in a different context, but in a certain situation that might be relevant, and so that association might be evoked. So I think yeah. like the, the beauty of how information is encoded in human memory obfuscates the need for random search, which, you know, it's only going to be useful up to a certain point, like up to a certain size. I mean, I know computers are getting faster and faster, you know, but, um, but at a certain point, you know, we're going to have problems that are so complex and so multi-stepped and so forth that you, throwing more computational power at it is not necessarily going to produce the, the right answer or the best answer, the answer that feels creative, right? Uh, well, in what you're saying, uh, honing, in your terminology, uh, a software person would call it a heuristic, and I think it would amount to the same thing. Uh, no, so I think of heuristics as being sort of shortcuts to means to end, like, you know, start at the end state and work backwards, or, you know, um, something like that, right? And, and it's, it's something more complex than, than a heuristic, I think. Um, and especially because heuristic implies that you could do the same thing over again and capture it and, and get the same answer, right? And, uh, and, and, and uh, I, get, I guess how I see the creative process is that the same thing could be done, you know, and just, but just change the context very slightly, and then that interaction between the state of your mind and the state of the context could come out very differently because of the non-compositional way that concepts interact with one another and that concepts interact with stimuli in the world. There's a lot of sort of unexpected things that can come out through some kind of interaction. And then the whole trajectory of how you think that creative through could come out very differently. And so you can't really capture that al algorithmically. I don't think of, you know, I mean, I'm trying to actually. And if you have ideas about how to do it, that'd be great. Um, but I don't think of it as an algorithm in the same sense that Deep Blue is an algorithm. 
I have a question. So, so many of these things, because they're biologically, they have direct biological um, ideas behind them, or at least metaphorically so, are easy to understand. But the notion of worldview, which I think, and you're showing it as a container, uh, at times, sometimes you're showing it as a kind of a, that things fit in it, is a, is a little bit more open-ended than saying, well, it's like this type of associative memory. Do you, do you have a better sense? I mean, do you, do you think the worldview right now is actually this fuzzy thing that you're, you're putting some context in, or you understand worldview very well, or, or do you actually think you have 20 years of work to understand worldview as well? So when you talk about worldview, give us a little bit more idea of what you currently think that is, and I guess a little bit of how fuzzy you know that is now, and, what, where you would might like to go to understand what this notion of worldview is a little bit better. Because I just see it as a, a general container and I'm trying to get more of a definition of it uh, from you. So what precisely do I mean by a worldview? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so your internal model of the world and um, is what I mean by a worldview. And it contains knowledge and it contains ideas, it contains attitudes and perspectives and so forth. So when you say worldview, you, then you mean you're I was always thinking there's a lot of worldviews, but you don't mean it like that. You mean there's one worldview that you're changing as opposed to these are a number of frameworks. You know, well, how you see the world. So if you, you have a bunch of concepts in your world and you have a bunch of ideas about them and if you can, I think of neural networks and I think of you know, these, these things that are connected by weights and so forth and that you can you know, represent the state of somebody's knowledge using the state of some kind of interconnected network. Right? Associative networks. Right, so let me ask the question slightly differently then, because you said you changed your worldview, and you went into a lot of detail, a lot of things, but there was less about actually how the process of changing your worldview happens. Do you, do you have a good sense of that, or right now that's that's more open ended? Um, so this transformation process that I'm yeah. talking about? Okay, so say something happens and you can't make sense of it, right? Like your wife does something completely out of character for her. Well then, what I meant by saying uh, you're attracted to a gap or you're attracted to you know, dissonance is that you know, your mind will instantly, without any effort, just spontaneously go towards the thing that it hasn't resolved. And the transformation of the worldview is just updating all of these connections until you have a new understanding that it can account for why she did that strange thing. Okay? And then you could say that um, you know, the magnitude of your dissonance or the extent to which you, ha you feel you have a problem or something that is unresolved, um, you, you experience that as emotions, right? So things that are not resolved makes you, causes you to feel emotions. These emotions signify how much reorganization or self, you know, change has to happen in order to reach a new equilibrium that can account for this perturbation. Great. Thanks. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it did actually. Okay. Uh, other questions? So we have one first. Do this one first. Well, I think this is actually related to uh, what you're talking right now. Um, so does this have to do with how, uh, why, uh, you know, ch uh, children that have gone through adversity, um, uh, you know, f uh, in that situation fosters more like the honing, you know, of creativity because their worldview, some, you know, like it's uh, in a way shattered, and they have to come up with, you know, these new um, ideas or you know, new ways to, uh, you know, find this equilibrium. Like, is that is that like why? Um, you know, uh, in those situations foster uh, creativity? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of people would like to think that creativity is, you know, the highest rung of Maslow's hierarchy and it's associated with the self-actualized person, that it's a, um, a symptom of, you know, having everything together and so forth. But in reality, psychologists were finding that, well, it's actually associated with having a lot of problems and, and some of them involve, um, you know, having experienced the death of a parent at a young age, there's a high correlation between that and degrees of ratings of creativity later in life, and um, and just high correlation. You know, a high uh, proportion of individuals who are rated as extremely creative have experienced some kind of childhood adversity, in, you know, when they were younger. So, um, so, so it seems to me that yeah, it, it sort of. It doesn't make sense with the kind of view of creativity that many people would like to have, but it does seem to make sense with the view of creativity as it being some, as a, a self-organizing, self-mending process, a way of finding a new equilibrium amongst all the information you've got in there. 
And because children who are exposed to adversity, you know, they do have a lot to figure out, right, to make their world right. And especially if they don't feel that they can trust the people who are their care bearers or, you know, they can trust the world that they live in, well, then they do feel that they have to figure everything out for themselves, right? Because there isn't necessarily the sense that somebody else is looking out for them. So I think it is consistent with that kind of data, yeah. It's interesting, isn't there some data, too, that the that creative people self-medicate more, so to speak, you know, the oh, writers yeah, and, yeah. and drinking kind of thing. So, again, not working things out and, and always having some frustration that it's not completely worked out. Yeah, if anybody's interested in that, there was a really good book that came out last year called The Dark Side of Creativity. And it's got um, a bunch of chapters by a bunch of different people on different aspects of this. So there's correlations between creativity and um, and uh, criminal tendencies. There's correlations between creativity and, um, and um, um, suicide and uh, and all kinds of things. Actually, one uh, one thing that I didn't present today actually has to do with that. Um, so some of these dark sides of creativity. One thing that I have this, I think I mentioned I have this computer model of cultural evolution. And one thing that I looked at it was to see, okay, what is the optimal ratio if you have some individuals who are creative and some individuals who are basically imitators, they just copy each other, what would be the optimal ratio of creators to imitators? And then how creative should the creative agents be? And I, in fact, did find that, if anybody's very interested, I'd show you that, I did find that uh, the society as a whole functioned best at a less than maximal rate of ratio of imitators to creators and less than maximal ratio of like the so the, and the creators should be um, not maximally creative and in fact there's a trade-off between the two so the more creative people you have the less creative they should be and then when I went in there and actually examined what was going on in the computer model I thought okay that actually makes some sense because what the creative agents were doing was they were blocking the diffusion of tried and true proven solutions across the society. So they, they were putting all their cycles into developing their own ideas instead of spreading the ideas that were proven effective, right? And, um, and finally, you know, after a lifetime of like thinking society is so mean because they reject us creative people, right? And, um, it, but it made sense to me that, okay, you should have to prove yourself if you're going to have, be able to spend your time on your own creative stuff, right? Because um, you actually are impeding the flow of tried and true ideas. And, and you shouldn't be able to do that unless society has a hint that the results of investing in your own ideas is going to eventually prove fruitful, right? So, so it's kind of an interesting result. Hi. So um, I was struck by what you said about how unresolved dissonance in, let's say, neural structures leads to emotional states and wanting to resolve that. So what is the, what is your current most detailed level of understanding about the, the mechanisms behind that? And do you think that, um, do you think that the neuroscience is currently in, in place that satisfies you as to how that might happen? Or, or do you think that you're still actively looking for more answers about how uh, the brain would come to measure its own level of unresolved structural uh, dissonance? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, by coincidence, coming out next year is a book called The Neuroscience of Creativity. So um, you might want to check that out. Um, but in terms of I think what's most interesting to you is sort of the relationship, the interplay between the emotions and the cognitive structure and how they're working together. Is that mostly what? Because I think yeah. that's not very well known. Mm -hmm. I think there's little hints it, of that. It, it but sounds so. like information compressibility and it sounds like perhaps air propagation signals, you know, but I, I'm not fully informed as to what the state of the art is, but I was wondering, yeah, how well, are we still have a ways to go or is that almost all, all there, you know? Yeah, no, I think, uh, well, I just was by coincidence recently talking to the head honcho editor of this Neuroscience of Creativity book, and he was expressing a little bit of frustration to me. He said, you know, this book, in five years from now, we could put up a way better book because we're just on the, the edge of really unraveling these things. But right now, 
it's a little bit frustrating. So, so I think, you know, we're on our way. But in terms of answering what exactly is the relationship between the emotional system and how it guides creativity and how can we understand this at the neural level, at the level of you know, anatomical substructures in the brain, I think we're you know, not quite there. Yeah, and, and, and just as a, as a very brief comment, I would, I would suggest that in, perhaps in music we might find a, a externalized examples of information structures which are deliberately built up to create a dissonance and then resolve it. You know, Yes. Being a very direct yeah. parallel there, right? So, yeah. Uh, anyway, that's, thank you. Yeah, and not necessarily to create a dissonance. It could be that that dissonance is something that is just sort of the musical form of a dissonance that you've experienced before. Yeah. Any last question? Here. Just, just maybe a, a, a quick comment. As I, as I, say, well, I think in Canada there's this researcher called Paul Taggart. And that's much more at the level of psychology and philosophy of mind. And his whole theory is about uh, cognitive coherence and is linked with Festinger and the dissonance theory. And so in psychology, there is tons of evidence of all these things that we just talked about, that the bigger the dissonance, the higher the emotion, the higher the motivation to um, reach a kind of equilibrium, you know, this kind of cognitive homeostasis. Uh, type of system. So this is, uh, I think, is in University of Waterloo. I don't know if yeah, you, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. They just had a paper in cognitive science a few months ago mm -hmm. on the creativity. Yeah. Um, he's actually leading a okay, not in next year's cognitive science uh, conference, but the one after that in Berlin. He's actually leading a uh, a seminar, some kind of. Yeah, some kind of seminar on creativity. So if you if you like going to cognitive science just once in a while, the one in Berlin would be a good one to go to for interest in, if you're interested in creativity. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I, I'd like to thank Leanne for a great talk and question and answer.